And <clears throat> all right, I guess we are live. I just got to find out if I can hear my voice. I don't want to uh, do this again live stream in a Okay, there we are. I can hear myself. And if you guys uh, cannot hear me, let me know. I'm sure you'll let me know. So, as you can see, uh, Francis Turretin uh, would, uh, this is an excellent uh, topic by an excellent, brilliant theologian. And uh, here is his uh, book that you can, uh, here we are, Francis Turretin. I got just got the, uh, just the book here. We're going to go through the digital really good and so i highlighted a few things in there so uh, i just got the part i got a mate uh from serbia who's got the three volumes as we can see there's cj foster he's got the uh but um uh, by the way emmanuel the king solo scriptura that scripture is the final authority your definition of sola scriptura is not the of the reformers. Um, just so we can be clear there. Okay. So, scripture alone is the final authority for faith and practice. So, your... So your understanding of Sola Scriptura is wrong. So please, Sir Emmanuel the King, your definition of Sola Scriptura is wrong. Yours is Solo Scriptura, which is wrong. Scripture alone is the final authority. So scripture is the uh, only infallible rule. It's the only uh, source of truth that is infallible. There is no other source of truth that is infallible, only scripture. There are other authorities like the, the church councils, uh, creeds, but they're not infallible. Okay. All right, Emmanuel King. Ho hopefully we got that wrong because it does annoy me when people get sola scriptura wrong. Okay. Please, sir, <laughs> get your definition of sola scriptura right because I found out many as we've just found out now, many people do not understand what Sola Scriptura is, and they have a very, and um, yeah, it's usually solo, my interpretation, sola, uh, solo Scriptura. It's just me and my Bible, and I don't need anyone's help uh, or no other three theologians uh, uh, interpretation of Scripture. Yes, yeah, Scripture alone is the final authority for faith and practice. So, uh, Please get that correct, of course. So um, we already got the Roman Catholics misunderstanding Sola Scriptura. We don't need exactly uh, our own. So uh, is that the same as his section in the Institute? Yes, it is, King David or David King. Um, there is, here it is. I've got it here. Uh, I'll post it in the comments section so you guys can uh, have a, a Look at it. Yeah, that's right. The Spirit will teach you, not for those exactly those who are lazy. Uh, the Holy Spirit, other people have the gifts. Uh, they, they, yeah, I know, I know it's you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, yeah, the, obviously with the, uh, you know who the Apostle Paul uh, was taught by? By the... Uh, Rabbinic teachers. So everyone is taught by some some other person, of course. Through the, the Holy Spirit can teach us through Scripture, yes. But the Holy Spirit can use other uh, means, uh, of course. And that doesn't mean we can just go out and just uh, reject all other theologians and sit under a tree and read the Bible, and we don't need any other person uh, helping us. So. Uh, we, we can go through this because this is K uh, KG. Uh, we, we'll go through this because of kind of introductory notes here. 
that I like to touch on because there's a lot of misconceptions of the uh, of the fathers. All right, so this is going to be, be a bit of a long introduction, so I'll quickly try to get through everything that I want to say. So if you guys want to go through to the uh, where I posted this, uh, go to the uh, community section where I posted the video, and in the comment section, I posted where I'm going to write my introduction. And um, instead of writing on a piece of paper, which you guys can't see, you guys can see it and uh, can follow along in some sort of way. Uh, so if you guys got any questions, I'll try to. Yeah, scripture with scripture will give you correct interpretation. Correct. Now, I'm sure if I was to say Mary's the Theotokos, you'd be going, be crying heresy. Well, exactly, because that would be, You'd be danger, in danger of Nestorianism, okay? So it'd be, it's really important to know uh, what is sound doctrine. Sound doctrine has been sound doctrine for the last 2,000 years. doesn't matter what anyone says, right? If you disagree with the term theotokos, well, that's just your interpretation, but how do we know we're right, right? Mary bore God in her womb. She's the theo, God, tokos, bearer. She bore God in her womb, okay? So I found out uh, as a... As I've been on uh, YouTube and Facebook, you fo slowly find out people who are uh, the solo my interpretation, just read scripture and nothing else. They're the ones who most likely are, uh, their theology is more heretical because they don't care about uh, what others said. How would you know what is heresy if you don't care about what others said in church history? If you, if you don't learn uh, the heresies of the past, you're bound to repeat it. Um, and so, but um, the, the the title to, given to Mary isn't really uh, given to Mary, but it's about Christ. Who did Mary bore in her womb? It's uh, God himself, true man and true God. And so the creeds are not uh, infallible, neither are the councils, but uh, we accept them because they're biblically correct. Okay, so let's get into this. So Quick introduction, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, the Reformers wanted to connect to the theology of the Fathers, continue the Catholic, not Roman, uh, faith. So obviously Catholic meaning universal or the whole, which was taught everywhere around the world uh, at that time, which was basically mainly uh, Africa, Europe, and a bit of Asia. It wasn't obviously throughout the world. Australia uh, didn't exactly have the faith back then, <laughs> um, but obviously Catholic meaning universal as far as it, the faith goes, that's whatever they were uh, believed, everyone believed, and the, the gospel everywhere it was believed around the world. Uh, we support the, of the, uh, we have support of the Father, so Sola Fide, Sola Scriptura, Penal Substitution Atonement, etc. So what I'm trying to say here is what we believe is not made up. Yes, it's found in Scripture. Now, here's the question. How do we know if our interpretation is correct? Um, no, I'm not saying that. You can have a chat with me one-on-one -on -one after. I'm not saying reading Scripture breeds heresy. When there's no theological framework, a non-believer can read Scripture and come up with modalism. Modalism is heresy, right? Uh, scripture is clear there is one God three persons. Now, how do we understand that? How can we understand the Trinity? There's many people who fall into heresy, who try to explain the Trinity, and they become they come out modalists, right? Uh, the Athanasian Creed explains it really well. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and so on. So the creeds give us a theological framework of how do we explain the Trinity, okay? I'm not saying reading Scripture breeds heresy. Um, but it gives us a good theological framework how we can explain the Trinity. Okay, so do not misunderstand me. Um, that is not what I'm saying. People can easily be misunderstood when they don't really. Please, sir, do your research. Uh, I'm assuming you may, you probably don't read much of the Reformers. Uh, this is what we're promoting: the Reformation faith. Yes, I don't think you understand what I'm saying, but anyway, um, so. So how can we know, of course, when we do hermeneutics, we do hermeneutics from Scripture. Uh, and of course, I kind of went through that with uh, Lewis Burkhoff and his uh, view of uh, 
hermeneutics and went through about the 2000 years of history of hermeneutics. Uh, so when we do hermeneutics, of course, we do it from scripture. Now, how do we know if our hermeneutics is right, right? We're faulty, sinful beings. We can be wrong. Absolutely, we can be. If you don't admit you can be wrong, well, you're going to be wrong for sooner or later. You don't accept correction. So how do we uh, test our, our hermeneutics? Interpretation. Of course, we, we uh, test it from those uh, theologians of the past, the Christians of the past. And, of course, they had many things right. Of course, they were not perfect. Um, so that's the thing. And many people just go by just me and my – just the scriptures as we find out that the – the uh, guy in the YouTube channel, right? The chat section thinks he's just my, me and my scriptures. Uh, uh, I'm right. We don't need anyone else. Well, that's a dangerous uh, position to take. It's in a sense, I'm right and no one, no one else, I'm right and everyone else is wrong. So is it possible that we could be wrong? Absolutely. So we got support from the fathers. Uh, Luther said that he's... Uh, Doctrine of sola fide, he didn't make it up. Of course, he got it from Scripture. Absolutely. Everyone gets it, their doctrines from Scripture, right? The cults get it from Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church get there's at least some from Scripture. Now, everyone gets their doctrine from Scripture. Absolutely. The question is whether the interpretation is correct, right? Um, so the idea was to be Catholic but not Roman uh, is the point. The Reformers said they're the true Catholic Church. And the Roman Church is not. Uh, if you read uh, the Heinrich Bullinger's Second Helvet's Confession, he says, we are the true Catholic Church and not the uh, Roman clergy. And really, he was pretty much saying the Roman Church has pretty much came about in the last couple of hundred years, really, in a sense. When you read the Fathers, that's not exactly the case, that the, the Roman Church has come about in the last centuries. The Roman Church did not exist during the time of St. Augustine and others, um, to be centered upon scripture, but also to have, so yeah, the reformers idea was to be uh, Catholic, but not Roman, to be centered upon scripture. Of course, sola scripture, scripture alone is the final authority for faith and practice. It's our only infallible rule. It's the only source of truth we have that is infallible. We also have support from the fathers. So let's say you, uh, we've got the Seventh-day Adventists who came along, 200 years ago, and they say, well, the, uh, the mark of the beast is Sunday law, okay? You're, you're wrong from Scripture. Uh, definitely we'll go to Scripture first. And they go to Revelation 13, 16. I don't see anywhere a Sunday law about there. It's just completely made up. Okay, let's see your second test. Is there anyone in the last 2,000 years of church history, well, 1,800 years for them, that actually taught Sunday law is the mark of the beast. Was there anyone? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No one taught Sunday law for 1,800 years. It's a new doctrine. Ellen White made it up for herself. Now, does that mean her doctrine is is false direct, pretty much straight away? Not straight away, but we know it's most likely false. We, it's, we can't take it seriously. We, we don't. No one seriously who knows church history would fall into becoming a seven-day Adventist and believing Mark the Beast is Sunday law uh, and, and worshipping on Sunday, then you're part of the Antichrist and so on. No one takes that seriously. No one for 1,800 years supported that. No one, everyone who read the book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 16 saw it and came up with Sunday law. Why? Until Ellen White. It, it she's, she's made it up. We cannot take it seriously. So that can be said with many other doctrines, okay? Declare not false doctrines of purgatory, of course, indulgences, etc. And the reformers got rid of the false teaching and with, went with the true, uh, pure gospel. You can be Catholic and Orthodox while being evangelical. That's what the reformers said. Uh, they were pretty much saying we're Catholic but not Roman, we're Catholic, but without the errors. They were popeless Catholics. <laughs> no, you, you don't have to convert to, to Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. You can be Catholic and Orthodox and being evangelical. I call myself I call myself Reformed Evangelical Catholic and Orthodox, just to make 
the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox just a little bit <laughs> annoyed. <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. In the 1800s, uh, the 1800s, exactly right. The 1800s rejected all the creeds and confession, or the creeds and the councils, and they say, you know what? Everyone was wrong before me. We're right. Let's start our own church. Not, not God's church did not exist. God, it's praise God. He's chosen us, and uh, that's that's what. And they were wrong. No, not uh, Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox, but not Eastern. Let me clarify. The reformers, and as I would say. I'm Catholic, but not Roman. I'm Orthodox, but not Eastern. Okay? We're just saying we're Catholic and Orthodox, but without the errors. Okay? That's what the Reformers are basically saying. Um, so you don't have to convert to becoming Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Uh, you can be one, in a sense, in, uh, from the Reformers, uh, who wanted to, of course, reform the church and get rid of the errors. And let's go to Scripture, but also with the support of the fathers. And this is a uh, live stream on the fathers, so I'll quickly. So we say, we hold to the creeds and councils. They weren't infallible, but biblically accurate. Uh, bit, uh, but the later councils, a typo there, but the later council went over the top, promote veneration of icons, which in, isn't apostolic. Of course, in the 700s AD, or 800, 700s AD in the Council of Nicaea, part two, I believe it is, uh, there were uh, the fathers then who supported veneration of icons. Now, that's not apostolic. Uh, the, the fathers were right and wrong on many things that we'll see later on. Um, so it's not apostolic. How? Well, you go to scripture. Is there anyone venerating an icon? And so on. No. Okay. Well, is is there any apostolic fathers who venerated icons? No. What about the second century fathers? Were there anyone there who supported veneration of icons? No. What about the third century? And so on. No. Well, it just came. It really came from what five six hundred AD. So on. Maybe a little bit later on. Not entirely sure, but I know one thing for sure. It's definitely not apostolic. The Apostolic Fathers did not believe it. The second century fathers in the saints of uh, Irenaeus of Leon, Justin Martyr, and so on and so forth, they did not promote it. Actually, a lot of them were against uh, images of uh, Christ uh, and, and, and the saints in a sense, but I don't really have a problem with icons as long as you don't worship them. Uh, the Reformers, a few of them, even Calvin, he did not like it in worship. But he didn't. He kind of had. Uh, I think even on he in his Geneva Bible or somewhere, I read that he had like a picture of uh, icon of Jesus in the Geneva Bible, which is a little bit interesting. So Calvin said, in a sense, that as long as you don't have it in the church where people can be tempted to worship the icons, don't do it. So one proof of doctrine, of course, if it's not taught in Scripture, but a second proof also is last. Well, a few hundred years after the apostles, did anyone teach it there? Is there a direct lineage from the apostles that taught a uh, veneration of icons? No. Was there anyone who taught purgatory or uh, indulgences? No. Well, we can safely say purgatory is definitely not apostolic in origin. There's no lineage from to a, from Augustine to, from, to Chrysostom to Athanasius to Tertullian or Oregon. And then gets to Clement of Alexandria and Arrhenius of Leon, um, Ignatius of the Antioch, Polycarp. There is no line. Uh, why don't they mention it? If it's apostolic, why don't they mention it? You know, so you kind of can use the fathers against the Roman Catholics <clears throat> um, because they're not they're not Roman Catholic, they're not evangelical, they're not Eastern Orthodox. Let the fathers be who they are. And just try not to twist their uh, writings, because anyone can when we try to. So, um, so if you cease to quote the fathers for your doctrine or interpretation, you give up the claim that your church is the same church of the past of the apostles, and that time on. So, what I'm trying to say is here: this, uh, we claim to be the same church as with the apostles. We are the only true church. You might well better not say that. You say, well, I, I would say. I say I at my church, my beliefs, 
my doctrines that I hold to is the same church as of the apostles and so on. Now, how? What? Well, I can quote you Irenaeus Sibelion's uh, view of Scripture, and I've done that before in uh, Sola Scriptura when I've gone through the Fathers with with the help of a, a very good book of uh, Holy Scripture, The Ground and Pillar of Our Faith by David King and William Webster, three volume. Go have a look at that in my live stream. Credit goes to them on that one. Um, <clears throat> so if you say like the cults, they don't quote the Fathers at all. They give it up, and they think the fathers are Roman Catholic. They give it up, and they kind of shoot themselves in the foot. Well, thank you very much. You just show you not the your church is not uh, the church of, of the apostles and of your fathers. How? Why? Well, if you don't say you say, oh, Sunday law is the mark of the beast. Okay, you can go to scripture. Anyone can go to scripture and make up anything up in a sense. And interpret whatever you want. Okay, let's see anyone in church history supported your claim. They got nothing. Of course, they'll reject uh, church history. Church history is against them. That's why people, uh, if that's why, if you cease from quoting the fathers, they're not infallible. But if no one in church history supports your view on a doctrine, then you're most likely wrong on that view. Your, your interpretation or doctrine is most likely false because the God. Because the uh, fathers, church fathers, read the same passage as you, and you, Johnny, come lately, say, I'm right, and they're wrong. Well, guess what? So many guys read the same scripture, and they're pretty much agreed on a certain view, and you come along and say, they're all wrong, I'm right. Well, why are you right and everyone else for 15, 16, 17, 800 years, 1800 years, why are they wrong and you're right? You know, that's kind of a bit of a test to know why? So if you cease to uh, quote the fathers at some point, you pretty much shoot yourself in the foot. You're saying that Church of Christ did not exist for a certain amount of years. Well, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will overcome it. God's church has always been around and will always be around. Has Will always be around. That's what I'm saying. Doesn't matter how false and how terrible God's church may have been back then. Uh, well, I'm talking about the Middle Ages. Uh, God's church was still there. Uh, Luther and Calvin quoted many of the medieval scholastics. Uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux taught sola fide. And it was there, but it was buried under many, many unbiblical uh, traditions. But it was still there. God's church was still there uh, and always have was uh for 1,500 years before that. So it just shows you don't have support for your doctrine. Could have made up any doctrine claim it's biblical. Like I said, look at the cults, the Mormons. They reject church history. They believe God is a God from planet Kolob. I mean, really, come on. <laughs> nice, nice guys. I'd say Mormons are one of the nicest uh, guys, nicest cult out there, but no point in being nice if you, false her if you teach heresy. Um, for thousands of years, they read the same scripture as you. You're the first one to come up with that doctrine. They're not infallible, but they're some sort of guide. Okay, so the fathers were a lot of uh, wrong in theology. Some took certain doctrines the wrong way and developed them incorrectly. Oregon, uh, uh, his view on pre-existent souls and so on and so forth. I um, mean, he may have been influenced by the Greek uh, thinking back then. Uh, Pelagius, as we know, the false teachers here. Oregon was condemned by a few councils, his teachings. There's a bit of uh, here and there thinking if he was a heretic or not. I don't think he was, but many of his teachings were. Because Pelagius, Nestorius, a lot of them, but a lot of them got it right. Uh, our doctrines were developed in like the Trinity. Uh, uh, St. Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, their view of the Trinity was really good. So what we believe... We stand on the shoulders of giants, Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, and many others. Athanasius uh, defended the uh, divinity of Christ, true man, true God. So what we believe, they were the ones who laid the foundations. If we don't uh, know church history, we don't care for it, then you're going to teach false doctrine. Seven-day Adventists teach a sort of an Arian view of uh, Jesus, and they may, have, they may be Pelagian, I'm not sure. Okay, well, our last one, we'll get into Turitim. The fathers weren't Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Evangelical, whatever you want to call them. They weren't exactly that. Let them be who they are. Let's not change what they believe or twist it, okay? The church fathers weren't 
Baptist with uh, uh, suit and tie and briefcases going to church <laughs> with their, uh, you know, uh, Trinity hymnals. Uh, and they didn't have their King James only either. <laughs> um, okay, let's just let them be who they are. Okay, you, you, you probably, some people really truly believe they were Baptists, like Ken Wilson, um, who, who the, the provisionists, pretty much some of them believe they were Baptists. I mean, really, come on. Um, so let them be who they are. Okay, it's so the Roman Catholic claim as their own. Not everything the Father said supports the Roman Catholic doctrines, right? That's true. Like uh, Chrysostom in his homilies on Romans and Galatians, he sounds like an evangelical, as uh, Jordan Cooper said. Uh, he, he pretty much exegetes chapters after chapters, and he comes up with sola fide, right? And, and there you go. <laughs> the Roman Catholic worst nightmare. So. I love Chrysostom. Uh, uh, he's probably one of my favorite church fathers, okay? So some support our beliefs, and some support the Roman Catholic beliefs, okay? Um, I can say with absolute certainty that the current view of the papacy wasn't even close to that of the first to second century, the Bishop of Rome. Okay, so back then and today, totally, totally different view of church. Absolutely, the early church quoted scripture for their final authority. Irenaeus of Leon against the heretics of the Gnostics, uh, St. Athanasius against the Arians, quoted scripture many times, and we can just go on. He didn't say, oh, we've got the infallibility of the church. No, he just appealed to scripture many times in his works. I've read them. He goes through on and on and on. So, And so there was no papal infallibility. No one really said, really appealed to the Pope as, the Pope's infallible, you know, neither did the Pope say he's infallible. Uh, and this was declared as dogma in 1870, <laughs> really. And no one really said anything before that. He had no unique authority and so on. So that's the quick um, introduction. That's only went for 27 minutes. Um, so uh, do you think the Baptist denomination close to you get to biblical Christianity? Well, not, not necessarily. I changed my view on paedo baptism because uh, the early, the because I quickly, I uh, changed my view from uh, Credo Baptist to Pado Baptist, um, but uh, because you think, oh, infant baptism was a later invention, centuries later. You re you look at scripture, you study scripture and church history. Infant baptism was firstly mentioned indirectly by Irenaeus of Leon and others, so it, it wasn't a later development; it was there. A generation away from the apostles, which is very, very early. Okay, so it's not like a few hundred, few centuries later that they said, you know what, let's baptize infants. <laughs> no, it doesn't go that way exactly. Um, and by the way, Colossians two pretty much says that uh, uh, infant baptism, pretty much in a sense, uh, circumcision, baptism, kind of are connected, but they kind of uh, uh, replace each other and you know, so on and so forth. But I kind of have done that uh, live stream before. So let's get into it. I've been blabbering on enough. Now, Francis Turretin, I've put it in the comment section there. And uh, here we are, the authority of the fathers. Now, this is not going to go for long because he's got like, what, 10 paragraphs and some of them are not exactly uh, what I want to, talk about it. it doesn't get into it that much okay here Britain was a very good theologian if you are uh, I would rec highly recommend his uh, dogmatics or systematic theology books is I think it's uh, three volumes um, so are the writings of the father's rule of truth in the teachings of the faith and the interpretation of scripture, negative against the Roman Catholics. So he says here, although it's already can uh, be adequately deduced the preceding question, the fathers cannot sit as judges in controversies over the faith. Yet because the Roman Catholics are forever bringing up the matter patristic consensus and have the habit of presenting it to us as the rule of truth, as a special, as a special, question is called for us on the issue, the greatest urgency in present-day discussion. So they're saying, 
the Roman Catholics are using the fathers, uh, saying it's against you, but they're saying it's kind of so they're kind of viewing them as an infallible uh, rule of uh, faith, there, as uh, Turretin has said. Uh, but he's saying here, so how we look at the term fathers here, Turretin says, my father is not understood as the apostles, the original founders and patriarchs of the Christian church, as does Augustine in his commentary, Psalm 45, but according to well-established contemporary usage and teachers, doctors, the ancient church who taught to explain the doctrine of salvation, both in speech and in writing, they are called fathers, both in respect to chronology, for they lived many years before our age, and because of their teaching, by installing this in their disciples, the begat children in the church, forgot, okay, so that's what we mean by fathers, because they started something, and they tried to continue the uh, Catholic faith, not Roman, Catholic faith, the universal faith of the apostles, uh, so that's what is meant. Now, what Trutin says here, I would disagree with him if I understand him correctly. If anyone else thinks I'm misunderstanding him, welcome to correct me. Although some would regard their period extending in the 10th century, we do not think it should be carried until the 6th. So maybe saying that, oh, okay, I maybe misunderstood him. I thought he was saying the church didn't exist for that time. I don't think that's what he's saying. He's saying, how should we view the term fathers? Only to a certain extent, he's saying here, because it is certain that of the 600 year when Antichrist raised his head, I think he's trying to say this of Pope Gregory, I think. I don't think he was the Pope back then, totally different. There was a great falling away with by the righteous judgment of God, a growing number of his of errors and superstitions. In the first century, after the death of the apostles, the chief fathers were Ignatius and Polycarp, whose writings of fragments survive. In the second, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. In the third, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, Cyprian, Ambrosiasta, maybe, or Ambrose, Lactantius. In fourth, Athanasius, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, Hilary of Poitiers, Basil, Gregory of Nanzianzus, Ambrose. Jerome, Gregory of Nyssa, Epiphanius, and John Chrysostom. In the fifth, Augustine, Cyril of Alexandria. I do love the both Cyrils. I do love Jerome and Chrysostom. I just got to declare my love for them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and Hilary of Poitiers. Um, Theodore, uh, Hilary of Ariles, Prosper Aquitaine. He was an Augustinian. Courage to read his works. And Leo I in the sixth century, Fulgentius, another Augustinian here. After Galatius, Gregory the Great, and others. So I guess he's trying to say the Antichrist, uh, the Pope, started to uh, come about uh, at that time, if that's what, uh, if I'm understanding him correctly uh, in that. So, among the Roman Catholics, okay, here we go. This is what I want to get to on my... Uh, spend a little time here. Among the Roman Catholics, there are three types of opinion about the fathers. First, those who are, equate them with scripture according to the decision of Glossator. The writings of the fathers, both as individuals as a whole, are authoritative. A second opinion opposed to them is that those who regard the fathers' writings as purely human and they, uh, therefore deny uh, they are the rule of faith. This was the conclusion of Kate Kayetan or the Kajetan. <laughs> uh, but being Slavic in my ancestry, I know the J is a Ute sound, but I'm not sure what uh, that sounds looks in Spanish, but I'm not exactly sure. In his preface to the books of Moses and of the wise and sound of Roman Catholics, the third opinion is that those who hold middle ground, the teaching authority of individual fathers, human and fallible, but the common and universal consensus of the fathers is divinely inspired. And infallible and controversy. This was the teaching of the Council of Trent uh, when it declared the tradition of the fathers both regard to faith and to morals. Uh, they are to be received in the same reverence of the mind of the Old and New Testaments. And that clearly is wrong. We should not view the fathers on the same reverence and mind of the Old and New Testament. They're not infallible. And the fathers would agree with you on that. Turretin will mention that. And again, it forbids anyone to presume to interpret scripture contrary to the sense which Holy Mother Church holds and is held contrary 
to the unanimous and consensus of the fathers. Session 4, Canon 1. Many Roman Catholics, Stapleton, Ballerine, Cano, Valentia, and others are in agreement. Okay, so here Turretin says the Reformed faith is orthodox. Okay, that's why I've kind of changed my name to Reformed Orthodoxy. I thought of changing it to maybe Reformed Catholicity or Reformed Catholic or Reformed Orthodox. Either way, like I said, I'm Catholic, Orthodox, and Evangelical. That's because I declare the uh, Catholic Orthodox faith of the past, of the the uh, fathers, church fathers, and of course that's why I'm kind of doing this live stream in a sense. Um, <clears throat> but the Orthodox reformed, although the hold the fathers in great esteem, exactly as we should, right, guys, right? The reformed, although they hold the fathers in great esteem. Now let's kind of stop there. <clears throat> uh, many of the uh, reformed guys kind of uh, have lost the uh, import importance of the church fathers. I guess maybe because they don't find them helpful. Maybe they're scared that people start converting to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholic. Well, it, it could be possible maybe if you uh, kind of held to the same sacrament as as of the fathers, not exactly the same, but sa same sacraments of the reformers, there would be no much of a change from the fathers to the reformers. Um, because, as everyone knows, anyone who reads the Fathers held to, uh, of course, baptism is what somewhat salvific uh, in that sense that uh, I did have read uh, Cyril of Jerusalem's catechetical lectures. Uh, he's uh, on Romans 6, I believe. He does say baptism washes away sin. And, of course, I have done a live stream on the Reformed view of holy baptism. It's not that much different to that of the uh, uh, fathers. Um, and of course, I've interviewed an Anglican priest, uh, barely Protestant, and a Lutheran, uh, a guy from Canada, I forgot his name, uh, Adam, not Adam, Matt Chandler, no, Adam Chandler, that's the one, Adam Chandler. Um, so, and we discussed the, um, since I'm Reformed, and in a sense, Reformed influenced the Anglican Faith, I could kind of say, I've said before and I'm kind of saying now, that I'm kind of Anglican in some sort of way. So the Reformed Lutheran and Anglican, they're basically uh, in unity uh, in in some ways on the sacraments. If you go to the, the Reformed view of it, that's the Second Helvety Confession. Um, so yeah, King David here is saying it, it belongs to God alone to be completely infallible and uninfluenced by the passions. Gregory of Nanziensis. There we go. And then we've got the fathers of the church. Uh, Gregory, Nanziensis, St. Ambrose, and all them are saying uh, that only God is completely infallible there and uninfluenced, uninfluenced by the passions. Uh, so here we, yeah. So we need to continue. I'm, so, I'm doing this. I'm trying to wanting to, Lord willing, uh, start a trend and, and hopefully the reformed guys, people, you guys, will get into the fathers because as as I try to, as I've read church history and changed my views a little very similarly to the reformers, I felt I feel like my faith is that of the church of the last two thousand years. That of the fathers. And that's why many people have seen someone who was part of Steve Lawson's church. He's become an Eastern Orthodox. Well, yeah, look, w when you when you see that no one was a Baptist until five, six hundred years ago, and the reformers were promoting infant baptism, and no one really was a Baptist for that for that long, you're going to be questioning, is my Baptist faith a new one, a new a new uh, belief, and then he became an Eastern Orthodox. I had a chat with him. Uh, so better for you to know this now than being told by a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. I even had a guide to me, come to me. Uh, I had a chat with him. Uh, he is a Reformed Baptist, I believe, and he had an Eastern Orthodox come to him and said, our church is the only true church for the last 2,000 years. And he challenged him on baptism. Now, he came to me and asked me questions. 
And you can see in this comment section my on holy baptism, the reformed view of holy baptism, the live stream I did there. He was asking me questions. Uh, and I told him, look, you don't have to become uh, Eastern Orthodox. Well, you can just hold to the view of the uh, the reformers. Uh, their, their view of baptism, Calvin held that uh, baptism forgives sins, unites us to Christ, initiates us into the uh, into the faith, um, and baptism uh, through Christ forgives sins, and so on and so forth. And I showed him that, and I told him that, and afterwards he's satisfied. Right. So what would a guy do who's a Reformed Baptist to having a chat with a Baptist? This is to our Baptist friends, right, <laughs> brethren. Um, what would people say? Oh, don't listen to them. They're not part of the church. They're, 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 they're wrong. Well, that, what kind of like, I mean, come on. No, well, no wonder people are becoming Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic. Study church history and align yourself with them. Not necessarily uh, believe what they believe, but... C, is it taught in Scripture? If you can't defend it from Scripture, then it's definitely not biblical, like purgatory, indulgences, veneration of icons, and so on and so forth. And so that's what I'm saying. You just study church history, and you'll, you'll see what I'm trying to say here. Um, and then and I had a chat with that guy, and he's fine now. Um, and he doesn't want to. And he was thinking of becoming Eastern Orthodox because the Eastern Orthodox challenged him on that. And uh, how many people would give him a satisfactory answer and say, oh, don't worry. Don't worry about uh, church history. He's wrong on that. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, they're wrong. That's heretical. No. I mean, come on, really. You just got to be honest. This is what I'm saying. Be honest with what you believe. Many people can't be honest with what they believe, what I'm saying. But anyway, and hold that they are the greatest value of understanding of true history of the ancient church. Amen to that. You read the fathers and you see that's what they taught. That's what they believe. That is the greatest value of understanding of church history, the ancient church, and that our agreement with the church of the chief articles of faith is manifest. Nevertheless, they nevertheless deny that they can be called authoritative in matters of faith and that the interpretation of scripture and the decision is one on which must stand or fall. But we believe that the authority is only ecclesiastical. And uh, I can't read this. <laughs> it's a little bit cut off. Uh, subordinate to Scripture and no way except insofar agree agrees with Scripture. Exactly right. And that's true. But uh, many people say, oh, and this is not exactly the best way to go about it. When you read Scripture and you're... A Baptist, oh, I don't say infant baptism in in Scripture, so therefore I reject their view. Well, yeah, look, you've got to have a good understanding of hermeneutics in that way. Um, like I said before, oh, I don't see anywhere that you can't be baptized twice, as we know the Reformers not a high, didn't have a high view of Anabaptists. Um, let's just <laughs> leave it at that. Luther, Calvin didn't have a, and I disagree with their what they what they did to them. Um, but yeah, you only get baptized once, okay? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I think that's the interpretation. Of there's one baptism, there's not two baptism. You only get baptized once. You read the Balji Confession, it says those who aspire to reach eternal life get baptized only once. So yeah, you only get baptized once uh, because it's such a uh, holy moment, important time, and uh and as bullying a Susan, he's held to confession. One baptism goes on for the whole the whole Christian journey, whole Christian life. And so, yeah. Uh, so we, I, I don't, I don't agree with everything of the fathers because I believe uh, I want it to agree with Scripture. So I don't believe it. I go with Scripture because Scripture is the only infallible source of truth we have. So now. Trutin goes on to say, it is not a question of whether the fathers or witnesses present the consensus of the ancient church or the opinion of the church of the time which they live, but whether they are judges who can settle controversy with infallible authority. Well, they can't. They don't do that. They're not infallible. Uh, the Roman Catholics maintain the latter. We, the former. Okay. Trutin says here, this is, the, uh, this is what we uh, hold to. It is not a question whether fathers or witnesses present the ancient church. Uh, or the opinion of the Church of Times, 
this is what we hold to. The fathers are witnesses of what they believed at that time. How do we know what the church believed? We read the fathers. Um, and so present the consensus. So how do we know uh, purgatory is false? Of course, it's not taught in scripture. Absolutely, it contradicts scripture. But not many of the church fathers actually believed in purgatory. Sure, sadly, Augustine taught it and a few others, but it, it was kind of more of a later development. Uh, the early fathers, really, especially from the East, from what I remember, don't really teach uh, purgatory at all. Maybe once and well, twice, but more in the uh, West. The, the Latin fathers uh, taught more on purgatory. I'm not exactly sure why or how. I mean, different influences back then, but not many of them taught it back then in the uh, East. Uh, so if we ever uh, argue against our adversaries in the basis of the fathers, so he's saying you can even uh, use the fathers in arguments, he's saying here, because we got the support from the fathers. And you, you'll see he says that later on. We use them merely as witnesses who confirm by their stand the truth that we believe. Exactly. We use them as merely as witnesses to confirm by their stand the truth that we believe. We believe the same thing as they do. Okay. That's what he's trying to say in that sense. And proclaim the faith, the church of their time, but not as judges whose decisions is to be accepted absolutely and without criticism. And those who are the standard of truth, the teaching of the faith or interpretation of scripture. And so, how long have I been going on for? 46 minutes. Okay. An hour is usually the standard. Uh, so, the reasons the fathers individually collectively are not prophets, apostles. Um, but we have Roman Catholic agreeing with us on this, like Ballerina rec recognizes that even the most erudite fathers were wrong. So, the, the uh, scholastics in the Middle Ages, medieval scholastics, said the, the fathers were wrong on a few things. Not in a consequential way on many matters. Uh, and so then there was none who were not faulty on something and, and then so on. The works of the fathers are uh, corrupt, interpolated in many ways. This is partly due to various pseudographic writings circulated in the name of the fathers, which judgment of scholars are recognized as false offspring, improperly attributed to the fathers, whether the fantasy flatteries, forgery, or heretics, greed of printers or booksellers. It is partly due to corruption of falsification. He says, you got to know, not everything that claims to be uh, written by the fathers is written by the fathers. And then he says here, drinks break. And so the fathers themselves recognized their writings were not authoritative in the sense that their bare assertion must stand in the teaching that they give gave on religion. Augustine wrote to Jerome, I admit to your charity that only the, the books now called canonical I have learned to pay such respect and honor to believe most firmly none of the authors erred in writing. When I read others, however, they excel in sanctity sanctity of teaching i do not regard statement as true because they make it because they have been able to convince me either through canonical authors or probable reason which does not conflict with truth nor do i believe that you bo brother think otherwise moreover i say that i do not believe that you want your book to be read as the prophets and apostles concerning whose writings since they are all Free from aura is not personally permissible to doubt. So Augustine is saying to Jerome, uh, I'm sure you don't want your book to be read in the same as the prophets and apostles. They will free from all error. But you, Jerome, brother, he says, you can be uh, fallible. You are fallible. Excuse me. You are fallible, uh, he's saying there. So the fathers can be wrong and have been wrong many times. That's what we're saying there. And then he says here, the Roman Catholics themselves repudiate the authority of the fathers and so far they recognize them as in disagreement 
as they freely depart from them, so untrue they accept them as judges in matters of faith. Many instances, besides the references already made to Bellarine, Sixtus Census and Salomon would, could be mentioned. Cat, Cat Jetan, in his preference for the Pentateuch, speaking of his commentaries on Scripture, says, if ever, if ever a suitable new meaning of the text is found, not contradicting of Holy Scripture or teaching of the Church, even though differing from the mainstream of sacred teachers, I ask all readers not to scorn it hastily. So, such authority, we should believe them because they wrote what they did is reserved for the authors of Holy Scriptures alone. So, the Fathers had a high view of Scripture. Some of them taught sola scriptura, as I uh, used, uh, as I've mentioned before, the uh, three-volume set of David King and William Webster. Good book, I recommend it to you. Uh, they had a high view of scripture. As I said before, Irenaeus of Leon, Athanasius, they argued from scripture against false teachers, heretics. Uh, Baronius frequently, freely rebukes or refutes the fathers where they teach something other than what he appro approves. If therefore adversaries themselves are found disdaining and despising the fathers, even when the fathers are in agreement, whether they are unacceptable, by what power will they require to be heard as judges in controversy? Exactly. And he says here, the universal church can and should accept whatever all teachers uh, offer and complain agreement according to the word of God. Okay, the word of God is the uh, final authority. But if the teaching is not from the word, but rather contrary to it, then it is so far from true that the church should receive it rather than is bound to call anathema, Galatians 1.8. And then, although the fathers who are closest to the age of apostles ought to be more pure, it does not follow their, that their writing can be regarded as normal like apostolic ones, because the gift of infallibility by definition unique to the apostles does not belong to the successors who are not endowed with the same gift. So, of course, the early, the apostolic fathers and a little bit down the track like Arrhenius of Leon, they're not infallible just because they're closer to the apostles doesn't make it so. But you could say their uh, teaching doctrines work is more pure. As time went on, you kind of start to see a problem, start to see a problem, uh, false teaching, um, Some someone's, I don't know where the influence came on exactly, maybe more of the Greek uh, 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 society, I guess, with purgatory and so on. As centuries went on, you start to see tradition being corrupted. You start to see the teaching start to be corrupted there as well. So. And that's what Turretin is saying. The early fathers were well, not infallible, but there you can you can see their writings a little bit more pure. And then he's saying the unity of the church is properly maintained, the unity of faith is transmitted in scripture, not by the consensus of the father, which is almost impossible to discover. And then he says here, obedience to due to leaders. And he says, although we are unwilling to accept the authorities as judges in matters of faith, we do not say that their authority amounts to nothing, okay? You do not neglect or reject the fathers because they give us support with what we believe. Um, yes, David King, volume three of our work is a catena of patristic testimony and holy scripture. Exactly right, really good. Uh, and that is true. And so we say here, we do not say that authority meant nothing. The fathers have got an authority. But of course, if they teach anything contrary to scripture, the teaching is to be rejected or doctrine. They can indeed be most helpful. Indeed, they can be. I found them to be very helpful. Uh, if not establishing faith, at least in their exemplifying and confirming it. So that by this witness, it may confirm the faith of the old church. And it may be seen the Roman Catholics manipulate consensus of the fathers rather than follow it. That is true. Some of them do do that. You read Ignatius of uh, Antioch, his view uh, of the Eucharist, the, the Roman Catholics have said before you, that he held to transubstantiation. No, he didn't. You read, he never says there is a change of the substance. Someone else, a few times, people, uh, Roman Catholics have said that, and the Roman, the Roman, the Romanists or the Papists, 
Um, they've said that, and I say, show me where is the change of substance. There is no, Ignatius of Antioch does not mention anything. He just says there's a real presence. It's there. Uh, and he doesn't say anything about, about of change of substance and that is a classical example of uh the romanists going to the church fathers and try to fit their doctrine and trying to make the fathers support it definitely not and so and the dogmas which they force upon us from the early centuries by tradition apart from scripture may be unheard they try to say oh it's in tradition well it's not in scripture it doesn't matter exactly what tr tradition says um how much more do we have? I'm not entirely sure, but we're close to finishing. It is useless for the Roman Catholics to pledge consist of the fathers for resolution of controversy and interpretation of scripture, because even if available, it would it would form only a human and probable argument, such as would be gained from the opinions of the prudent, but not necessarily true and beyond appeal. Since the fathers submitted themselves to opinions of scripture, exactly they did, because if not impossible, it is very least very difficult to discover such a consensus you know so uh, this is especially so because one can hardly know what the fathers would have felt about our controversies both because we have very few writings of the fathers especially of the first and second third centuries whose opinion is preferable of the later ones which is true yeah because closer to the age of the apostles because what does survive from these three centuries deals mainly with question for unto our controversies and is relevant them to accidentally in another context. And also, by the way, also the f because the fathers both often disagreed with one another. That's true. Called each other heretics. Uh, Jerome did not like Oregon's view. We wanted to condemn him, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, Prosper Aquitaine and John of John Cassian didn't like each other. It just went on and on. Well, you, the Roman Catholics say, oh, you guys got uh, disagreements. Have you ever read the Fathers? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's very interesting how they always say that, but uh, they never look at their own, uh, in their own church, but also in church history. They never really thought about it that way uh, and often change their minds and under the same article of faith differently as they grew in knowledge of the truth with age, as elders disclaim they were believed when they were younger. Um, and so, he quotes Augustine there, and I think this that's basically it. There we go. How long I've been close, going to an hour, I think, 57 minutes. So, I think it was uh, Ignatius of Antioch who first used the term Catholic in reference to the church. That's correct. It was uh, Ignatius of Antioch. He did use the term Catholic first. And the Roman, the, our Rom Romanist friends would say, oh, you see, he's saying Catholic. It was, And many people start to think, oh, wait, the, the Roman church was, well, existed back then. And they start to bring in uh, the converts from that, <laughs> even from Ignatius of Antioch's uh, view on the Eucharist. So I think I've pretty much gone the... Uh, point here now and of course i i would like to of course promote here uh these books and uh here, here they are there, there you go 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 get your go get these three volume volume set Really good, as you can see. Got a bit of a bit of a research done there. Okay, it's late here in Australia. It's past midnight, and uh, here they are. Really good. Look how thick they are. Really good work. <laughs> it has strengthened my faith. I'm saying I'm Catholic and Orthodox, and I use these books to support my Catholic faith. <laughs> Till a Romanist comes along and gets offended. <laughs> so this is real good. Get yourself these. I'm not being paid by this. I'm doing this by my own free will. <laughs> or I'm, I'm being predestined, whatever you want to look at it. Um, well, we've got more viewers now. Uh, look, look, get these book. This is what it's called, Holy Scripture. 
the ground pillar of our faith, volume one. Well, well, that was volume two. This is volume one. And volume three. There we go. Really good. And I guess that's basically it from me. But also, don't get don't forget Yaroslav Pelikan. There we go. This is if you love your church history, get that one as well. And so I guess I could uh, home and bowing, but we could go on for ages, of course. Anyway, I guess I could be going for ages. But nevertheless, get yourself them books. And I guess I gotta hit hit the hay here in Australia. It's past midnight. Everyone's basically waking up. Yes, I'm from Australia. Some people, one, someone's asked me before if I am, uh, if I'm English from England. <laughs> you cannot. Well, there it can be a little bit that way. Some of them, uh, some of the accents can be real, uh, real similar. But nevertheless, thanks guys for listening and watching. I'm not sure what my next. Um, what my next uh, live stream will be, especially I've got work. But uh, uh, if you guys got any suggestions, please let me know. Uh, maybe I'll start uh, continue on with the Turretin uh, series, what else he has there, but I don't think there's anything else. Um, but, yeah, that's why I haven't been doing – I've been thinking of doing this, but apart from this, I don't know what my next live stream will be. But, anyway, thanks – Oh, we've got a Canadian uh, listening. But nevertheless, thanks, guys, for listening and watching. Uh, like and share this if you want. I'm not going to force you. <laughs> uh, God bless and have a good day and night. Thanks, guys.